So long as these problems are not solved, so long as ignorance and poverty remain on Earth, these words cannot be useless. Episode 4. These are the words which preface the fourth of seven broadcasts based on Victor Hugo's great novel, Les Miserables. Blank Conversations Theatre Company presents Gus David Sanchez, actor and director, in an adaptation of the book, which Orson Welles has created especially for radio. Each episode portrays some development in the progress of Jean Valjean, the role played by Gus David Sanchez, and Ed Montez is also heard reading the narrative. Les Miserables, Part 4. Jean Valjean, you are a hardened criminal and a second offender. You are charged with concealing your identity and changing your name. How do you plead? Guilty. You are found so by this court, Jean Valjean. You are sentenced to hard labor in the galleys under the double chain for the rest of your life. The Notebook of Inspector Javert, July 1823 I have caught Jean Valjean. In a whole lifetime of service with the police, there is no entry in this book which has occasioned in me so much satisfaction. I have caught Jean Valjean. I am affixing to this page an excerpt from a recent newspaper in Paris. Here it is, the Paris Journal, July 25, 1823. An old convict has been brought to trial called Jean Valjean. The circumstances are extraordinary. In the district of Montreux, a gentleman called Monsieur Madeleine had, in acknowledgment of his service, had been appointed mayor, and as such he was famed for his wisdom and his good works. But this man has been unmasked. The police authorities, thanks chiefly to the zeal of Inspector Javert, have disclosed the true identity of Monsieur Madeleine. He is none other than the convict Jean Valjean. It appears that previous to his arrest, this man had succeeded in withdrawing from his bank a sum amounting to more than 500,000 francs, which he had deposited there, and which it is said he had realized in his business. Since his return to the galleys, it has been impossible to discover where this money has been concealed. This is the end of the newspaper article. I think I can guess the motive of Jean Valjean concealing this money. His hope of escape. And there is another matter, the child, Cosette. The child of the woman Fantine. It was this Fantine whom I apprehended on the street, and who... Valjean, in the character of the male, mayor, protected from justice, and in the compassion of one criminal to another, nursed through the illness from which she died. This child was abandoned, and at an early age, to the care of some innkeeper. If I know Jean Valjean, the purpose of this money is the care of this child. I must find Cosette. November 17th, 1823. Here is an excerpt from the Toulon Journal yesterday. A convict at work on board the galley ship Orléans, on his return from rescuing a sailor, fell overboard and was drowned. His body has not been recovered. This man was registered under the number 9430, and his name is Jean Valjean. This finishes it. The case is closed. Jean Valjean is dead. Tonight, we are to consider the story of Cosette. Cosette. Fantine had left her with some innkeepers called the Thénardiers. 
the little Cosette, the child of Fantine. Jean Valjean had promised to care for Cosette. Javert never found her. Now, who were these innkeepers, these Thénardiers? This man and this woman were cunning and rage married. A hideous and terrible pair. Cosette was between them undergoing their double pressure like a creature who was at the same time bruised by a millstone and lacerated with pincers. The man and woman had each a different way. Cosette was beaten unmercifully. This came from the woman. She went barefoot in winter. That came from the man. A ferocious mistress, a malignant master, a rascal of the subdued order. Thénardier's code as an innkeeper is interesting. The duty of the innkeeper is to sell to the first comer food, rest, light fire, dirty linen, and smiles to charge for the open window, the closed window, the chimney corner, the sofa, the chair, the stool, the bench, the feathered bed, the mattress, the straw bed. To know how much the mirror is to tax that. To make the traveler pay for everything, even the flies that his dog eats. Cosette was their only servant, and this child of eight did the work of a full staff. She brushed, scrubbed, swept, ran errands, lifted heavy things, puny as she was. And the moment the poor girl wearied in her back-breaking tasks, the huge figure of Madame Thénardier loomed above her, shrilling commands through the inn. Cosette! Cosette! Oh, there you are! Well, what have you been doing? Nothing, as usual. You know we need more wood for the kitchen. Now get it! I don't keep you to waste time! Christmas Eve, 1823. Pretty windows, candy booths, toy stores, parties, and good things to eat. Little shoes at the fireplace for Father Christmas to fill. Extra work at the inn. Extra work for Cosette. You, girl, have you watered my horse? Oh, yes, monsieur. He drank it all. <laughs> That's a lie. He has a way of blowing off when he's not had enough water. But I know all too well. Let some water, Cosette. Excuse me, ma'am. There is no water. Well, then go get some! Where must she go for it? To the spring. But it's night. It would take your courage to go along the streets without a lantern. She'll know she can see. Now get along with you! The child fled with the bucket, running as fast as she could. The night was cold and the spring was far away. Soon... The gleam from the town disappeared, and the darkness became thicker. It was no longer the town. It was open country, dark, terrifying country. The child's heart pounded at her ribs, with her ghost moving in the trees. Time after time, she faltered and started back towards the inn. But always there appeared to her the more dreadful specter of Madame Thénardier, and she went on. At length, she arrived at the spring. Cosette did not take time to breathe. She felt in the darkness for a young oak which bent over the spring, found a branch, swung herself from it, bent down and plunged the bucket in the water. In that moment, she did not notice that her apron pocket emptied itself into the spring. The fifteen sous fell from her dress and dropped into the water. Cosette neither saw nor heard the coins fall. She was anxious to start back at once, but the effort of filling the bucket had been so great that it was impossible for her to take a step. For on this night, this starless, terrifying Christmas night, that bucket was heavier than ever before. The woods were blacker, the wind was colder. The child tugged at the stooping weight, managed a few steps. Terror gripped her, terror, terror of something she couldn't see. She began to count aloud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
One, two, three. She had to go on. If only for a few steps at a time, she walked on, bending down like an old woman. The iron handle of the bucket was numbing and freezing her little wet hands. On and on, a step at a time. Madame would beat her. Madame would scream at her. Madame would whip her. All at once, the weight of the bucket was gone. A hand had caught the handle and was carrying it easily. Cassette raised her head and saw a large, dark form beside her in the gloom. And she was not afraid. Oh, thank you, monsieur. My child, that's that's a heavy bucket you're carrying there. Yes, monsieur. Give it to me. I'll carry it for you. Ha! Here we are. It's very heavy indeed. How old are you? Eight years. Have you come far this way? From the spring in, in the woods. Are you going far? Oh, yes, monsieur. A good quarter of an hour from here. Little girl. Yes, monsieur? Have you no mother? I don't know. I want to think I have one. Everyone else has one. For my part, I have none. I don't believe I ever had any. What is your name? Cosette. Where do you live? At the inn. Is that where we're going? Yes, monsieur. Who is it that sent you out to the woods after water at this time of night? Madame Thenardier. Hmm. What does she do, Madame Thenardier? She is my mistress. She keeps the tavern. The tavern? Well, well, I'm going there to lodge this evening. Show me the way. Look, we're on the main street. How far is the inn? We are close by. Monsieur, may I take the bucket now? What for? Because if Madame Thenardier sees anyone else bringing it for me, she will beat me. Oh, not on Christmas. Is it Christmas, monsieur? Oh, it's you, is it? Why have you taken your time? Madam, here is a gentleman who, who is coming to lodge. What? Oh, monsieur, come in. Have you a room? Oh, my brave man, I'm sorry, but I have nothing. Put me anywhere, in the carriage or in the stable. I would pay as if I had a room. Forty sous? Very well. Forty sous. In advance, I do not lodge poor people for less. I shall want some supper. If you are prepared to pay, monsieur, very well. Oh, I forgot the bread. Cosette! Cosette! Oh, madam, the baker was closed. Did you knock? I did knock, madam. I'll find out tomorrow if that's true. And if you're lying, well... Give me back the fifteen sous. Come, didn't you hear me? Have you lost it, or did you steal it from me? It's gone, madam. Forgive me, please, madam. So you lost it. It must have slipped my pocket at the spring. Oh, madam, it won't ever happen again. I should say not. I'll teach you to lose my money. No, no, madam. Please, please don't whip me, please. Madam, madam, madam. I beg your pardon, but I just saw something fall out of the little girl's bucket and roll away. This may be it. Is it a 22 sous piece? <laughs> Why, yes. Isn't that what you gave her? Why, yes, yes, that's it. Cosette, don't ever let that happen again. Get to work. Now, monsieur, let me show you to your room. Late that night, a stranger went to bed. Not in the stable as he had expected, but in the best room of the inn. This courtesy on the part of the Thenardiers had, as usual, a purpose behind it, a purpose which the irritable Madame Thenardier could hardly understand. What was in his head to protect that little monster? To pretend she lost twenty sous? Oh, look at that. That's a slap I wouldn't give ten sous for. It's very simple. It amused him. He has the right to do it if he can pay for it. Why you to fear as long as he has money? But no matter what you say, I'm going to kick out Cosette tomorrow. You are indeed. So soon, monsieur. Are you leaving us already? 
Yes, madam, I am going away. Monsieur, are you sure there is no business in your family? No, no, I have none. You do a good business here, madam. So, so, monsieur, it is a very little place, as you see, and we have so many expenses. I had a little girl, it is out of house and home. Ahem. <clears throat> what little girl? Why the little girl, you know, Cosette. Well, madam, suppose you were relieved of her. Cosette, huh? Oh, monsieur, take care of yourself. I drink. I'd be blessed by all the things. Uh, agreed. Really? You will take her away? I will immediately. Call the child. Cosette! Uh, where is my bill? Uh, how much is... Here it is, monsieur. It is for 23 francs. Naughty A, what news? This man is going to take Cosette off my hands. I shall fetch her at once. 23 francs, you said. Here you are, monsieur. Pardon me, monsieur. There is an extra charge for the candle. That'll be two francs more. Well, thank you. Monsieur, as to the little girl, I must have some talk with you about that. Well, your wife seems anxious enough to get rid of her. That may be, monsieur, but I must say that I adore the girl. What? You wish to take our little closet from us. I'm afraid, monsieur, I cannot consent to that. It is true the child costs us money. It is true the child has faults. But we love her. We must all do something for God. After all, one does not give his child to the first traveler, you understand. I do not even know your name. Now... If I were to see, perhaps, some papers you have? A passport? <clears throat> Monsieur Tenardier, people do not take a passport to come five leagues from Paris. If I take Cosette, I take her. That is all. You will not know my name or my abode. You will not know where she goes. And my intention is that she shall never see you again in all her life. Do you agree? Yes or no? In that case, monsieur, I am sure I must have... 2,500 francs. I was prepared for this. 1,500 francs. Come along, dear. You are not frightened of me, are you? Here she is, monsieur. Wrap yourself up, child. It's cold, and we're going away. Wait, monsieur. My money... I've given you 1,500 francs, Monsieur Tenardier. You have your money. Come, Cosette. What luck, husband! He has taken a little wretch, and we have 1,500! Don't be a fool. We might have had thousands. Why did he come here for that ugly brat? Who is he? In heaven's name, who is that man? <laughs> Was that man? He was Jean Valjean. In his fall overboard from the ship, the sea had been kind to him, and the sea had hid him from the galley guards. The sea, which was supposed to have closed the case and the inspector's notebook. Number 9430 was very much alive. So Jean Valjean took Cosette away with him to Paris. Jean Valjean had never loved anything. He had never been father, lover, husband, or friend. To teach Cosette and to watch her playing was nearly all his life. And then he would talk to her about her mother and teach her to pray. It is very sweet, this grand and strange emotion of the heart and its first love. Poor old heart, <laughs> so young. And for Cosette, from the first day, everything that she felt in her being loved this kind older friend. She called him father and knew him by no other name. Valjean was cautious. He never left the house in Paris by day, keeping prudently to the infrequented side alleys of the neighborhood. He would 
walk sometimes an hour or two at nightfall. Now, there was in that district an old beggar who sat crouched on the edge of a condemned well. Those who were envious of this poor creature said he was in the pay of the police. He was an old church beetle of, of 75 who was always mumbling prayers. Jean Valjean never passed him without giving him a few pennies. One evening, towards the close of the winter, as he was passing that way, he noticed this beggar crouched in his usual place under the street lamp. The man, according to his custom, seemed to be praying. He was bent over. Jean Valjean walked up to him and put a piece of money in his hand. The beggar suddenly raised his eyes and stared into his face. Then he quickly dropped his head. It was over in a moment, but Jean Valjean shuddered. It seemed to him that he had seen by the light of the street lamp not the calm, sanctimonious face of the old beadle, but a terrible and well-known countenance. Some instinct kept Jean Valjean from speaking. He gazed at the crouching figure, the same form, the same rags as on any other day. He told himself he was mad, and he hurried home. See the bird on my tree, the... Cosette. What is it, father? Quiet. There's someone in the hall, father. Who is it? Don't talk. He's stopped, father, just outside the door. Father, why are you blowing out the light? Little one, you must go to sleep. Yes, father, but what does he want now? Please, please, Cosette. Yes, father. Is he gone, father? Has he gone away? Put on your clothes, Cosette. Hurry. Yes, father. Uh, where are we going? I, I don't know. I don't know. We're leaving Paris tonight. Does it have something to do with that man in the hall, father? Father, what was he doing? Do you know him? I know him. What's his name, father? His name is Javert. <laughs> Through the sleeping city, through the narrow, silent streets, running, creeping, doubling back, describing one hundred sly patterns in the labyrinth of backcourts and alleys and passageways, ran these two hunted beings. The old convict, who had been the mayor of a city, the little child who had been a slave, frightened, breathless, unspeaking, fleeing the terrible policeman, fleeing Javert. He came to a blind alley. There were high walls there. And to the left of the corner, where a street began, Jean Valjean saw a sentinel. He felt as if caught by a chain that was slowly winding up. At this moment, a muffled and regular sound began to make itself heard in the distance. Soldiers! Jean Valjean saw the gleam of their bayonets. They were coming towards him. They came slowly, stopping to examine the recesses of the walls, to search the entrances of doors and alleys, Javert led the way. There was only one thing possible. In the prison ships, the old convict had learned a strange art, the art of climbing without ladders or ropes, of supporting himself by the back of his neck, his shoulders, his hips, and his knees the art of raising himself straight up the right angle of a wall to the height of six stories. Jean Valjean looked up the wall, measured the distance with his eyes, about 18 feet. The difficulty was Cosette. He needed a rope. Where could he find a rope at midnight on a deserted street? Then Jean Valjean saw the street lamp. At that time, there were no gas lamps in the streets of Paris. The lamps were raised and lowered by cords traversing the street from one end to the other. With these cords, the wheel on which the rope was wound was locked below the lantern in a little iron box. Jean Valjean sprang the bolt of this box and in an instant after was back at the side of Cosette. He had a rope. A half minute, and Jean Valjean was on the top of the wall. Another, and he pulled up Cosette. The next instant they were safe, safe on the other side.
Father? Yes, Cosette. Can I talk now? Yes, little one. Father, where are we? What is this place? I don't know, my child. Father, how long will it be until Javert finds us here? He won't find us here. Conversations Theatre Company has brought to life Victor Hugo's absorbing masterpiece Les Miserables, the episode which introduced the listener to Cassette. The cast is as follows. Gus David Sanchez as Jean Valjean. Ed Montez as the narrator. Scott Procato as Judge 2. Jeff Peckham as Javert. Matthew Escada as Monsieur Thénardier. Emma Kenny as Madame Thénardier and Cosette. And Calvin Shervinko as Man 1. The announcements were done by Thomas Vasquez. If you liked tonight's broadcast and wish to see the continuation of programs such as these, consider donating to Blank Conversations Theatre Company. You can visit their website at www.blankconversations.org or check out their social medias. Thank you for tuning in, and be sure to tune in for next week's episode on Friday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time in the next chapter titled The Grave. Thank you, and good night.